Ben Anderson with the Olympia Fellowship of Reconciliation. This TV series explores a variety of issues that relate to peace, social justice, and nonviolent social change. Right now, our world and our nation are suffering from huge problems related to war and other kinds of violence, social and economic injustice, and damage to our environment and climate. The problems seem so overwhelming, and all of our formal systems, governments, big business, centralized media, and so forth, seem totally dysfunctional and corrupt. Many people feel overwhelmed by problems and powerless to address them constructively. So are we doomed or can we learn from our mistakes from activities we've done in the past to work on these kinds of issues? The peace and justice movement has accomplished a lot because of the wise and effective efforts of women throughout the world and including our local community. We're much better off because of uh, some local women's uh, skillful and dedicated organizing. And this is true in communities across the nation and around the world. This month's TV program invites several experienced uh, local women to share their experiences, insights, and wisdom about organizing for peace, nonviolence, social change, economic justice, and the environment. They'll share some stories and share some insights uh, that can help us solve our current and future problems. I'm happy to welcome four people that I respect a lot and I always have a good time talking with. Uh, and they're still active today, even with a good track record uh, for each of them. Holly Gwynn Graham, Gabby Clayton, Bortai Hargrove, and Ruth Lippo. I'm glad you're all here. We will have a good Thank time. Um, we'll begin by asking each guest to briefly share a story or some background experience, and then we'll have a, a wide-ranging conversation around a number of themes that uh, several guests have in common. So let's start with, with Ruth. You're 90 years old, and you've been active as an activist for more than 70 years, and, and uh, people in this community just take delight in hearing you talk about some of your stories and some of your uh, recommendations for what we should be doing. At, at the age of 13, you were the only female at a meeting of persons supporting Upton Sinclair's campaign for governor of California in 1934. Tell us about that. Yeah, it was called the Epic Movement, it, huh. a, End of, of Poverty in California, and thousands of World War I veterans were supporting him. That was during the Depression. They were unemployed. And my neighbor across the street, who was my girlfriend's father, invited me to go to a meeting. And I was about 13. I was the only female there. And um, it was the first time Hollywood made pro used propaganda. They made you know, short, a short film, and they showed a little old lady rocking in her chair. And she said, if Upton Sinclair is elected, I'm going to lose my home. He got 38% of the vote. But many people think that um, Franklin Roosevelt was influenced by the Epic Movement to pass, to enact Social Security. So while we may not win every battle, sometimes we plant the seeds for change that other people will pick up later. Uh -huh. Um, you had another experience uh, in 1939 uh, regarding two trade unionists, Tom Mooney and Warren Billings, who were being framed for a crime that they were innocent of. Yes. Tell us about that case. That case, of course, in the 30s uh, was very important to trade unionists. Uh, the two of them had been in a parade uh, <clears throat> during the war, 1917. A bomb went off. They were framed for the, uh, the bomb going off and were put in prison for 22 years. Mm -hmm. And finally, a, govern a democratic government freed them, and it meant a lot to mm -hmm. thousands of people in, at, at that time. Mm -hmm. And um, when they marched in San Francisco, Harry Bridges, who was the president of the International Longshoremen and Warehousemen's Union, 
headed the march along with uh, Tom Mooney. Uh -huh. And I, was, I felt privileged to hear Tom Mooney speak at a huge rally in Los Angeles at the time. He only lived a short time after that. Uh -huh. Well, I know you I have a lot of other good experience with, with the trade union movement and working for peace and just all kinds of good stuff. And we'll, we'll catch some more of these stories as the, as the program proceeds. Uh, Bortai, um, you have a, a, an example I've heard you tell about a couple times about during the Vietnam War, how you and some other people reached out to some folks who were not yet in the peace movement and not really aware of the realities of the Vietnam yes, War. Yes, I, I, was, uh, I was active in Madison, Wisconsin, uh, in the peace movement. And of course, we had a very active student population in Madison. But we felt we were not reaching uh, the middle class and that the, in order to make real change, we'd have to reach beyond the student uh, population. So we decided uh, to go to churches. We thought that's where we could access, we could find some middle class people. And uh, this was during the Vietnam War and uh, for those people who may not uh, remember or may not be old enough to remember, uh, napalm was being used uh, as an anti-personnel weapon in Vietnam. It was just dumped onto, onto the jungles and napalm uh, was a form of gasoline, a gasoline jelly uh, that was engineered to stick to human skin. And when it burned, it was, it, it was excruciatingly painful. Uh, and it was several times hotter than boiling water. And at this time, this is in the mid 60s, uh, Ramparts magazine came out with the photos color photographs of children who had been maimed by napalm. So we decided to take these photographs, which were horrifying photographs. We didn't even want to look at them. And we rolled them up and we got dressed in our best clothes. And the students who came with us cut their hair. This was the era of, of long hair. They even cut their hair to come with us, which was a big sacrifice. And uh, they came in, we went into churches and we sat through most of the service until the minister began to his sermon. When the sermon began, we stood up silently and held up the pictures of a maimed children who had been maimed by napalm. And it, it caused a real commotion in, uh, in every church. Uh, sometimes we were bodily thrown out of the church. Uh, a couple of times we were asked to stay afterwards and uh, talk to the congregation. One minister even prayed for a better bombing pattern over Vietnam while we were there. But always we created controversy. And uh, the controversies were reported in the paper, the Madison papers. Uh, some of the churches had debates for weeks afterwards about it. It really did reach them and makes them start talking about something they had not wanted to think about. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, was, that was our theory, I think, that with shocking them would make people who had comfortable views of the world uh, suddenly face something unpleasant that they did not want mm -hmm. to think about and, and explore it more. We, the demonstrations were fairly successful because we went every week to a different church or synagogue. Some weeks we went to several. On Easter Sunday, we went to three different churches. And by the spring, by the time about six months had passed, some of the ministers or assistant ministers decided to come with us. So we actually influenced some people. We made some people decide they had to start. And one of the, one of the comments that was made in the paper was that this is the first time in decades that anyone has taken the church seriously. Hmm. <laughs> well, thank you for sharing that. And we'll get some more stories from your uh, uh, background uh, as we go through the show. Um, Gabby, um, you have an interesting background uh, before you came to this community. And uh, the, the people know you locally because of the work that you and your husband Alec have done. Uh, as for human rights and opposing hate crimes and, 
and of all kinds, mm -hmm. and especially a after the, the context of, of uh, the, your, your son's tragic death. Right. Tell, tell us the story of, of what happened with Bill. Um, when we moved here, our kids were 12 and 10 years old. <coughs> Sorry. Bill was 10 and grew up as a normal, very active kid. Mm -hmm. And when he was 14, he was very nervous, and one day he asked if he could sit down and talk to me and our housemate. And he was really shaking, and he said, finally said, I'm bisexual. Mm -hmm. And I looked at him and smiled and said, so's your dad. Mm -hmm. And so all of a sudden, he realized that it was going to be okay. He was safe, that he had a home that loved him and supported him. Mm -hmm. And so he was very out and open through three years, wore pink triangles on his backpack, got involved in student activist club at Olympia High School, mm -hmm. and was one of the students who invited uh, Colonel Greta Kammermeyer to come mm -hmm. speak for Women's History Month. Mm -hmm. And all hell broke loose in Olympia when word got out that the students had asked her because she was the first um, soldier who came out as, when she was passing a security test. She was asked if she was a homosexual, and she said yes. And so she was thrown out of the military. And she was amazing, and the kids wanted her to speak. So she was asked, and, and there was a huge um, school board meeting. And Bill asked if I would come speak to that, and I did. And the school board decided to let Greta speak to the students, which she did. Mm -hmm. And it was just about a month later that Bill and his best friend Sam and Sam's girlfriend Jenny were walking back to Jenny's house after renting a film and they were near the campus of Olympia High School when a car drove up and three, four guys in the car started yelling out the window, hey, are you guys fags, are you queer? And Bill and Sam and Jenny saw the school board, the school was closed for spring break and they decided to cut across the school grounds in order to get away from the car. Mm -hmm. And the next thing they knew, these four guys came up and beat Bill and Sam really viciously, brutally, broke Sam's nose, kicked, kicked them in the ribs, um, and then took off. And they called the custodian who was still on the property, and the police were called, and it was taken as a hate crime because Bill was open about being bisexual. Mm -hmm. Sam was assumed to be gay because he was Bill's best friend. Mm -hmm. And there was... Um, a police report and an amazing anti-hate crime rally at Sylvester Park that Olympia Unity and the community mm -hmm. pulled together where we had hundreds of people that came and supported our kids and our families. And things seemed at that point to be going pretty well, but after the hate crime rally, Bill crashed and got very depressed mm -hmm. and finally told me he was suicidal and he agreed that we couldn't watch him 24-7 and so he agreed to go to the hospital where he spent about 10 days. And when he came home, it was just a little over a week later, he committed suicide. Mm -hmm. And it was because even though he came from a family who totally loved and supported him, the only place this 17-year-old kid felt safe was in his house. And he felt like he was going to be facing hate the rest of his life, and he was dealing with post-traumatic stress, and he couldn't deal with it, so mm -hmm. he ended his life. Mm -hmm. The, the community appreciates the work that you and your husband Alec have been doing through Unity in the Community and other and PFLAG, uh, Parents and Friends uh, of Lesbians and Gays, mm -hmm. and other things to, to make the community more more humane and more open and more accepting and and really more unified. Um, and uh, so you you take I mean every, each each of you has experiences from things that have happened and how you've gone with it. Tell, can you tell us something of what you've been doing since then? Yeah, um, I had finished undergraduate school in drawing and painting and film and video and animation and then went on and got a master's degree in counseling at St. Martin's, which I did in, 2000, in 1993. And Bill died in 1995. And the internet was just starting to really be accessible to regular people like mm -hmm. me. Mm -hmm. And so after the initial surviving, which we did because we were supported by an amazing community here, 
I felt like I had to do something to keep Bill's spirit alive and his story alive and knew that it could reach other people. So I learned how to do web design by teaching myself one step at a time and used the skills that I had had from a lot of different things I'd done in my life and put Bill's story up on the internet first as a one page and then as his whole story which has had hundreds or thousands of people write letters that are posted on the website. Most of them supportive, sometimes letters from kids who were suicidal that found Bill's story and said, I'm not going to do it now that I've read your son's story. Mm -hmm. Occasional hate mail, which I left there so that people could see what that looked like. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I've done a lot of public speaking mm -hmm. here in Olympia and nationally. Mm -hmm in various ways, just trying to keep the yeah. story out there because there's still so much of that going on. Yeah, I, I, your, your experience with uh, Families United Against Hate is powerful. Can you tell us about the co-founder Sure, that absolutely. And, and, and what the two of you have done? Well, since? that happened because I put Bill's story online and a woman named Carolyn Wagner in Arkansas in Fayetteville have her son was gay and was assaulted um, during school lunch period at his Fayetteville High School. And she and her family took the, the, took the case and, and said, this is not okay. And the reason they did that, she found my story because of being online and so we started supporting each other. But Carolyn was the son of, a, I believe he was a deputy sheriff in a little town in Arkansas. He was a member of the Klan and his, she, when she was 12 years old, she once saw her dad tie a black man to a railroad track with his Klansmen in their robes and then walk off to leave him to die. And she snuck down and let him go and told him how to get out and get to town. Yeah. So she saved that man's life. And that was always who this woman was. So when these kids assaulted her son, there was no way that she was just going to say, mm -hmm. boys will be boys. Mm -hmm and her family wound up suing the Fayetteville, Arkansas School District and won a federal case that included that now includes gay people in the Title IX decision uh -huh. so that schools can't that take federal funding are not allowed to not protect gay and lesbian and bisexual students. Yeah. And so she and I decided we had to take what we learned from all of the things we were doing and use it to help other families and other communities mm -hmm. and other survivors of hate crimes. And, and that's Families United Against Hate, so uh, www.fuah.org. Right. Yeah. So thanks for sharing that. Thank you. Um, Holly, um, you've told, I've heard you tell your story about growing up in Florida and then <laughs> living a while in England and getting politicized uh, and then coming back. Tell, tell us some of that background of Florida and England and life after England. <laughs> West Coast, Florida, St. Petersburg, Bradenton, not the hippest of places as far as the civil rights movement went in 1960 to 63 when I was in high school. I never marched in a civil rights march. It really didn't impact me. Although when my mother and I were driving around one day with my formal uh, hoop skirt in the back made of white silk from my prom dress, a man at the gas station said, oh, I see you're one of us. And my mother looked at me and I looked at her and she said, what? And he went, you got your uh, robe back there, don't you? And we, oh, <laughs> yes, we said, and paid for the gas oh. and left, the, oh. left that place. Oh. But, you know, Florida was segregated. Uh -huh. It was the segregated South that was... Uh, everything that you've seen in the movies was happening then. And by the time I got to college, um, hardly any difference. I graduated in 1967, and um, a friend named Diz Disley gave me an opportunity to move to England, saying, it may be rubbish, old girl, but by jingo, it's British rubbish. <laughs> so during the Vietnam War, 68, without really a political thought in my head, but a lot of angst after going through school and going through the various things we do as kids in college. I did move to England in May of 68, and 
it was an eye-opening experience, and it was, I didn't have a thought of empire. Mm -hmm. I know England is the evil empire. I mean, now I understand empire. None of that vibrated with me at all mm -hmm. when I was just a kid. But little by little, I realized I felt safe there. The Bobbies weren't armed. Um, I did music, Diz uh, had a marvelous career. He took me about, you know, and ended up playing with Stefan Grappelli, the great jazz mm. fiddler for many mm. years, brought him back from the brink of obscurity. Mm. And um, I and eventually wanted to stay in England, so I got married, and married a marriage of convenience. I bought him a hat, he married me. And then later I got married to, for real to Davy Graham, who was a fine guitar player. Davy was also a, Philosopher King, um, and not only revolutionized British folk music with new tunings and unusual ways of playing the guitar, but also read and was scholarly. And he and I began what I can only call my education. Mm -hmm. And I looked back at my country from the distance of an ocean and a little island and saw the Democratic Convention where the you know, the hoses came out and the kids were tear gassed and it looked like a confederacy of idiots. Mm -hmm. And I looked at my country for the first time from far away and I wasn't proud. And Davy mm -hmm. said to me, Holly, we stand on the bones of at least 28 people. And I'd go, what's he talking about? I don't mm -hmm. get it. But little by little, mm -hmm. as I saw the films from Vietnam and I saw the soldiers coming home and I saw the guns and, and the things done to the people working for civil rights back in this country. Mm -hmm. And I saw the dogs being uh, let loose on people and the young people being murdered mm -hmm. because they stood up for civil rights. I did slowly come about to that understanding mm -hmm. that I had a lot to learn and it was going to be an interesting mm -hmm. ride. So when I came back in 73, I was active. and at the end of 73 and 74, I started forming coalitions and working for safe energy and working yeah. against nuclear power, working for peace and justice, mm -hmm. really detesting war. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's been like that since. Yeah. So, and we'll share some of those uh, examples and activities as, as we go through the hour. Well, uh, there, there are some uh, recurring themes that, that, that the four of you have have mentioned or that I know of from your background and your activities. And I want to explore some of those um, in, a, in a conversational way. Um, it would be fun, what we'll do during the program here is see what we can learn from your experiences and, and apply to the situation that we find ourselves in now. Um, all, all four of you have shown great courage in, in acting boldly, often against great odds or in times of, of danger or at, at some risk. Um, what, what insights do you have from your boldness or your activities that, that can help us figure out how to proceed nowadays? Any? I, I think for me, somebody explained me to myself after Bill died and I became active in that aspect of working for LGBT equal rights mm -hmm. um, by saying, well, your, your family were activists. You came from an activist mm -hmm. background, so of course you would do that where it would be natural for you and not for maybe somebody else. And mm -hmm. that may be true. Um, my parents were left-wing activists. Mm -hmm. I grew up on picket lines and was expected mm -hmm. to be an activist. Mm -hmm. And actually, my mother, I was never a good enough activist for my mother, and I probably still wouldn't be if she was alive. Uh -huh. And so I just finally put that aside and said, I'm not here to please my mother, I'm going to do things my way. Uh -huh. But, you know, it's it's a matter of not really knowing where the path is going to take you for me, for me and just uh -huh. figuring it out one step at a time, but not by myself, um, uh -huh. with a huge, amazing community that I've been really lucky to be adopted by and adopt into my family. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Other insights? I mean, you have, you have a uh, you were active during the McCarthy era in the '50s when, in this country, anybody who was perceived as being left <laughs> was became like the enemy. It's like now what they refer to somebody as a terrorist. You know, it's just an easy glib thing. 
to toss out, oh, that person must be a communist, oh, that person's a left winger or whatever. And you lived through that in the 50s and you stayed active. Do you yes. have insights into your boldness at that time? You, you, don't, you don't think of yourself as being bold as, you know, you're just doing it. I was a, a shop steward in the uh, Longshoremen and Warehousemen's Union, Local 26, and there was only one other woman leader in that union. So I uh, spoke about gender equality and race equality um, at a, a union convention where Harry Bridges also spoke. Mm -hmm. And uh, because I think it's important, you know, women bring uh, insight into getting child care, getting gender equality. Uh, so I think that was, the <coughs> that was the first time that had been raised in that mm -hmm. union. Mm -hmm. So I think today, even though unions are you know, under attack, and I understand that there now is a woman president of that local uh, Latino. There were Latino women, mm -hmm. but they had not hired any African-American mm -hmm. women. Oh. And uh, during that period, my ex-husband, <coughs> who was a producer, was called before the House Un-American Committee, and he named me <laughs> mm -hmm. and all our friends. <coughs> and because uh, we were her, my husband was an active trade unionist. We were harassed by the FBI. He was continually fired. He kept losing his job. And um, it was a difficult time. But um, you but, just... But, but you stayed active. You stay active. You, you, don't, you can't give up. Yeah, yeah. But uh, <clears throat> so as I think Dalton Trumbull said, well, everybody was a victim. He included the informers. And I thought it was interesting. I saw the Hollywood, was it Hollywood, how many was it? Hollywood 10, I think. I think it was 10. Uh, off when they, you know, left uh, the Los Angeles airport. And one of the uh, blacklisted writers, when he went to Danbury Prison, he was in the same prison as the head of the HUAC was put uh, in prison uh -huh. for uh, some kind of corruption. Yeah, so the, the, just the, <laughs> so people know the blacklisted were people who, because of their leftist politics or their perceived leftist politics, were blacklisted. They were prevented from getting jobs or from holding jobs. Then HUAC was the House Un-American Activities Committee that was right. doing that investigation. So the irony from what you said was both, both were there at that same prison. And it wasn't, was just, it wasn't just Hollywood. Thousands yeah. of people lost their jobs, right. teachers, yeah. social workers, yeah. trade unionists. Uh, the left was purged from the CIO. And yeah. Of course, I mm -hmm. think they paid for that later. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> yeah. Well, another thank you. Another recurring theme from, uh, that several of you have connections with is, is uh, working in coalitions with other, other groups, serving as an ally to constituencies or demographics or clusters of people that are getting picked on. And I wonder, Bortai, if you could share this story about uh, serving as an ally to help uh, the Black Panther Party uh, people in Los Angeles. Yes, I, uh, I was a social worker in Los Angeles and I belonged to a small group of really activist social workers. Uh, at that time, uh, the Black Panther Party in, in Los Angeles and, and all over uh, projected a really macho militant image. You know, they wore uh, black leather coats and carried guns, but they also had very successful social programs. The largest one was the Free Breakfast Program. At its height, the Panthers and the Free Breakfast Program were feeding uh, thousands of poor children a free breakfast every morning throughout the nation. And it was a precursor to the later OEO free breakfast programs and the later free breakfast programs that were adopted by the schools, mm -hmm. and I'm sure influenced them. Yeah. 
uh, the Panthers had a series of, of programs in the, in the social programs in the ghetto. One of them was a medical clinic. And the medical clinic was open on Saturdays uh, starting at 8 o'clock in the morning. They did all kinds of medical counseling and uh, they had a free ambulance service. They had other, other programs which they called their survival programs. A member of our little group of social workers had been a third year medical student. So he volunteered at the Black Panthers free clinic on Saturday mornings. I used to call him there occasionally. One day, and this was in uh, 1960, winter of 1969, he called me at five o'clock in the morning to tell me that the Pan Black Panthers uh, were surrounded by the LAPD. And they were really, there were about 70 of them, including women and children in an apartment above the Black Panther headquarters on Central Avenue. And they were afraid, they wanted to, to surrender, but they were afraid they would be gunned down. Yeah. And this, this was an era where Panthers were being gunned down all yeah. over the country, yeah. uh, in, in Chicago particularly. Yeah, uh, they were shot in the back while they slept. That's yeah. right, sl that's shot right. In the back. In bed, and this is only yeah. that was only about a police, month prior police, that that yeah. had happened. So they wanted to. They called all of the, uh, the people, the contacts they had, and asked them to please come by and stand by as witnesses wow. when they surrendered because they were afraid they'd be gunned down. So my then husband and I jumped into our car and went as, uh, as close as we could to Black Panther headquarters, but the police had it all cordoned off so we couldn't get there. But uh, I went into my office. I was working for the uh, Los Angeles Department of Public Social Services in the Florence District. And I spent the morning calling everybody I knew, all the members of our little group. We were also active in the Social Service Workers Union, SEIU Local 535. Mm -hmm. And so I called all the union reps throughout Los Angeles County. I spent the entire morning calling and they responded. By noon, we had a picket line of social workers, a large picket line of social workers going around in a circle on the intersection that was closest, as close as we could get to the Black Panther headquarters. And we could see the police on the rooftops with their guns watching us. But uh, that, I think the fact that we came out so rapidly to support the Panthers and to assure that the, well, we hope, hope that they would not be gunned down, had a, an influence. So that time, uh, Panthers were able to surrender peacefully. But of course, um, about six months later, the LAPD did the same thing, surrounded the Panthers, and two Panthers <coughs> were killed on that raid. <coughs> There's an, another recurring theme uh, that I know some of you have is using humor or various kinds of arts. I mean, you have backgrounds in the arts you had connections with the film industry in, in Los Angeles. You've done all kinds of theatrics and music and whatnot, <coughs> and, and a lot of wit. Um, what could um, could could somebody share some some insights or ideas about? Tell us something about some of your exploits or successes or activities. Okay, you know, I think that the arts are an excellent teaching tool, and we're grateful for that. I think Hollywood, at its best, tells the truth sometimes about issues we need to learn more about. I think music can make a big difference. I think being part of the industry, but peripheral to it as an independent, as an independent helps one maintain a certain, um, let's call it independent, well, um, you're not invested with the money, you're not you know, you're not one of the tools that they're using to make money. You're helping tell the story. It's all about telling stories, truly. And I like to do that with music. I like to research a topic and then put it in a song. I do that a lot. Mm -hmm. um, lyrics are us. But yeah. I like theater that matters. I'm just, I borrowed from you, from Glenn, a play Joseph Heller wrote, same man who wrote Catch-22, mm -hmm. wrote a play that I saw in New York City in 1960, on one of my trips home from England, I guess it was 69, uh, called We Bombed in New Haven. 
I'd, I'd like to get it out again because I think with our drone uh, record, the fact that we're bombing innocent people mm -hmm. and children mm -hmm. with unmanned craft from a safe place in Connecticut or wherever these guys are is criminal and reprehensible and also needs to be looked at. And so I'd love to update that play. Mm -hmm. I got to meet Dalton Trumbo in 1971. I took a little trip home and ended up in Los Angeles. I hitchhiked across the country. Don't try this at home, children. <laughs> and, but at the time, it was pretty safe. And I had a friend who went with me. And I was invited to a garden party uh, for the ACLU, the American Civil Liberties Union, at Bel Air, a big mansion with a gorgeous garden. And it was for Dalton Trumbo, his new movie. At the time, Johnny Got His Gun was just mm -hmm. released. And I had been part of KMET's radio thing where I was picking music for the news. And uh, so because of that connection, I was invited to the premiere mm -hmm. and then by the producer to this party. And I met Dalton Trumbo, who was beautiful, beautiful shock of white hair and a handsome man who had done a long time in prison because of his mm -hmm. being set up, basically, you know, as one of the Hollywood Ten. And he uh, spoke about his time in prison and the making of this movie, which is, I've just got it from the library. I'd like to see us bring that back, Johnny Got His Gun, which is one of the most devastating pictures of the hideous nature of war and war injuries. And now, because we have this triage mm -hmm. thing happening, you know, on the field, young people are coming back with hideous illnesses mm -hmm. and diseases, and not diseases, but injuries mm -hmm. that really otherwise would have, so it's not a humorous t topic, but it certainly deals with the arts. The arts are very mm -hmm. important, yeah. and I, I'm glad to be part of that work. And mm -hmm. you've played Daddy Warbucks, <laughs> Glenn in a skull cap. Yeah. Is something yeah. to be seen. That's, that's a different that was production. A, that that's was a, a different good production. Skit. But we had some fun we and had taught. Fun. We had fun. You can use it to teach. Thanks. Um, I, Ritha, I, I wonder if you could share, um, you, you've got a, 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 a background with a film that we've actually shown in Olympia called The Salt of the Earth. Uh, the, the film is available from our Timberland Regional Library System here on DVD, um, The Salt of the Earth. It's about a, a, um, a strike in a zinc mine in, where, New Mexico? Yes. And where the, what, and this was like from the, from the 50s, but it, it's yes. an amazingly powerful film about being allies, but also mm -hmm. using the arts because it was Latinos and, and Anglos working together on this, and women were so much empowered uh, to carry on with the strike. And tell us about the connection involving uh, you. Uh, it was a feminist film. It was made by blacklisted uh, directors and writers and grips. Uh -huh. And for some, my name at the time, I was married to someone by the name of Barnes, and somehow there's a woman organizer named Ruth Barnes, which is loosely based on me as a character. Uh -huh. But it, it's a wonderful film. I say it's feminist, it changed lives, you yeah. know. And then they were harassed, you know. They could have made another film about making the film because they were harassed in uh -huh. New Mexico. And the president of the union played the lead, yeah. and I think they had some of the women. And mm -hmm. the, uh, the leading actress was a famous actress from Mexico, mm -hmm. and she, I don't know if she got to work again, oh, yeah. and she went but back. Mo most of the actors in that film were the actual people involved yes. with mm -hmm. the strike. Wow. It wasn't just a bunch of actors that they... No recruited, it was the actual people. Except the, the one Except woman. for a few, yes. yeah. It's a great film. It, it's, it's a great film. It's amazingly good. I'd and like and, the, and Timberland Regional Library System, uh, our socialized library system, mm -hmm. has it. I mean, it, it, it's a, the, the government buys a building, they buy a bunch of books and videos <gasps> and things, and they say, come and borrow them, no charge. <laughs> I mean, that's socialism. Oh. I, I love libraries. I do too. Anyway, that's, <laughs> but that, it's, it's great that you have that, that personal connection with it. And it's again about being allies and it's using the arts to, to tell our stories. Um, all, all of you have decades of working on these, these issues and I'm wondering uh, if there are some other aspects of it, other lessons that we've learned over the years that we could pull up and help us um, 
with our, our struggles now, because all of you are active still in, on lots of issues. Um, what, what are the similarities and differences from the past and now, and what lessons can we learn and apply? I feel to say, I think speaking honestly to youth um, and even fifth graders and fourth graders about issues when the opportunity comes up when there's a teachable moment is worth its weight in platinum. I think that we should tell the children the truth. We should tell them our truth. Many of us have stories about you know, what we did or who we are and how we lived and we can tell that. We can say, you know, tell the truth. And when it comes to speaking about peace and about justice, don't leave out the justice part mm -hmm. when you talk about mm -hmm. peace. It's critical. I think that's one thing I've, mm -hmm. and I've been inspired by our nuns, Jackie, Carol, and Ardeth, mm -hmm. who all did time in federal prison, but the Berrigan brothers and the Berrigan mm -hmm. sisters and the, and, you know, the plowshares movement, all of these mm -hmm. things, we've been given so much strength by example. Mm -hmm. Um, that it's important for us to honor that mm -hmm. and honor our experience by telling it like it is. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, Gabby, what, what um, do you offer? I absolutely agree. And the other side of that is to pay attention to and listen to the youth Definitely. as teachers and leaders for us because I do that constantly. I, I'm just amazed. A recent example in Olympia was when the Westboro Baptist Church mm -hmm came, and I'm putting church in, yeah. and even Baptist in quotes, uh -huh. um, but the Fred Phelps family came to picket Olympia High School and the court and the courthouse and the right. state capitol right. because they said that um, it's about homosexuality. We're all evil in the state and the country and marriage equality, which is coming up again because they're fighting it. Um, that's why they came to Olympia mm -hmm. now, but it was the the students at Olympia High School who led an amazing um, community rally, rally where they decided that they didn't want to focus on the hate. They knew that these people were coming to picket their school and they created an amazing celebration of unity and diversity mm -hmm. at the school which drew about a thousand people including the students and Matt Grant, the principal, and the other faculty and staff at the school supported the kids, but the youth were the ones who did it. Mm -hmm. right. They designed a logo. They decided they wanted to turn the back, their backs and our backs on hate. Mm -hmm. And they had music and they had speeches. And mm -hmm. it drew this community together in just an amazing celebration. Yeah. And, and it was another example of why we need to let the youth lead us. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm, I'm honored to be on the board of an organization called Youth Guardian Services that runs email lists for lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and ally youth. And it was started by a young man when he was a teenager. And by the time he was 19, it was a 501c3 organization. And he's now in his 30s, and he's wow. still the founder and the treasurer, but the organization is completely run by youth between the ages of 13 and 25. Mm. Wow. And the youth run the organization. There's a few of us over 25 on the board of directors, and mostly mm. we just get out of the way and support mm. them uh -huh. and let them do it. Well, I, I remember back when the, when the neo-Nazis were trying to organize in Olympia, and they did not find very fertile ground <laughs> right. uh, for, for their kind of politics. But the students at Olympia High School, again, and some other students, right. other, not just Olympia, but other high schools collaborated, and they put on a wonderful event um, at the Washington Center. Yeah, they did. And, 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 and again, it's the same idea. The students have better sense than to buy into that, and they well, had a good way of... Yeah, the neo-Nazis were coming, and part of what they said they wanted to do was to recruit the white street youth right. to be part of them. And so our youth took that very personally, mm -hmm. and that's what I think motivated them to say, not in our yeah. town, not yeah. here, yeah. and that yeah. was an amazing celebration. Right. And the unity in the community group that, that you and I and so many others were a part of uh, supported that. Did supported that and did a lot of other great right. activities to to resist that kind of hatred. Um, and we did one of our TV programs on that topic. Yeah, you did. As a matter of fact, um, other uh, other aspects of things we can learn from from the past or either way well, back or more recent past. Yeah, I, 
lived through a period in the early 70s when the new left was breaking up into factions, warring factions. They spent more time fighting each other than doing anything constructive. Mm -hmm. It was very painful, very painful. I was trying to, at that time, our little group that I had been with had been broken up, and I was trying to find a group to join, to work with. It was very difficult. You'd go to one group after another, and they all had uh, the revealed truth, which they, they call the, the correct line. Mm -hmm. And I knew, you know right away that they're dogmatists when they do that. And so I, I, I wouldn't work with them. And um, I think that that's a lesson that the, the young people today need to learn. I know the Occupy movement uh, is now debating. Uh, they have been very inclusive, and I think they need to stay inclusive. If they want to get people out on the streets, which is the only way they're going to make real change, is to get multitudes out on the streets. They're going to have to be inclusive. They're going to have to be tolerant of other people's points of view and, and avoid the kind of factionalism that broke up the new left. Um, in, 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 um, anybody who's mentally healthy keeps growing all their life. They keep evolving. They keep reflecting on who they've been and who they are and, and what else they need to do. Are there other things you can tell us about um, uh, 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 building a sense of self, stretching, growing, being more of who we could be as our potential? Um, not, not just yourselves individually, but people living nowadays as we grapple with this world around us. Are there, are there things you can draw from that add to that? Yes. Oh, thank you. <laughs> well, You're very on, welcome. On to the next question. Are, no, so, well, I'll be brief, however. Okay. Hey, thanks. Um, thank you. No problem, really. It's okay. I, I, you know, I think there are things we draw on. We draw on a community. We draw on the, the wellsprings that come up among us, all the marvelous people in the various organizations that surround us that we could, I'm like the widows, my, I tithe my little $10 here, my little $10 there. But I feel great strength and great hope here especially, and like in Skagit County where, you know, mm -hmm. I, I found a, a, an organization that was opposed to nuclear war and just we wanted disarmament. And, you know, I think it's really critical that we have each other and we have the youth and we have those circles that mm -hmm. bring us strength. And mm -hmm. where would we be without them? We also have some very good publications. I mean, I think Works in Progress is marvelous. Mm -hmm. I think Olympia Power and Light is marvelous. Mm -hmm. I think pretty sometimes, you know, we have like Kim's show, um, on you chaos, have Kim Dobson's Kim Dobson. Parallel University, right, eighty nine point three Thursdays at noon. That's right, Very noon good. to one. And you've been the Energizer Bunny of reconciliation yeah. over the years. Mm -hmm. I think it's very important that we just keep on mm -hmm. and keep on growing. I mean, you can get depressed. Look at poor mm -hmm. Phil Oaks. He took his life, mm -hmm. but I wish he hadn't, because those songs, you know, we still need oh, those, those are great songs. songs. Yeah. There but for fortune go you yeah. and I. Yeah. All of that stuff is real and critical, and we're like, we carry stories, but the children are living their stories, and we want them to feel hopeful too, uh -huh. so listening to them is important. Good I, job. Yeah. I think there's, uh, there's always the unexpected, you know, having... <coughs> Been in the 50s, you know, the McCarthy era, and I listened to Pacifica Radio, and I heard a few people from the free speech movement, you know, from Berkeley, were just a few of them. I thought, you know, that they're not going to, when if they're going to go anywhere? And all of a sudden, right. it, that was such a surprise. The 60s, you know, mm -hmm. mass movement. It started with the African American students, I think, inspired the students at Berkeley. Mm -hmm. And I think this generation is going to find their own voice. Mm -hmm. And we have to be, listen and be supportive. And yeah. It's important to listen because yeah. it's not going, we can't just talk to ourselves. Right. How do we, we have to reach and, out to, uh, and, and we may not be the leaders, right. you know. We have to, other people come up with ideas and yeah. we should, join with them. And, and all of these movements build based on 
the movements that have gone before. So I mean, the, like the labor movement did a lot. And when the civil rights movement came along, and the Vietnam peace movement, and the women's movement, and the environmental movement, and movement for changing US, the US war against uh, <laughs> Central America, and all of these, uh, I mean, all of these movements, in some cases, the same people will work on something, and they'll say, oh, OK, I'm going to work on this issue now, you know, genetically modified foods, or whatever it is. Um, and, um, and, and people draw from their experiences and the insights and the wisdom from previous movements and apply them to new issues. And so whether it's the same people doing this again or new people who draw upon the wisdom of the folks who've gone before, uh, I, think, I think there's, well, and that's what we're trying to do with this program. <laughs> and also lift up the voices of women who do a lot of the really substantive organizing and, and, and don't get the credit that they deserve. There's a great book by Tony Cade Bambara called The Salt Eaters um, that really showed what the black women did in their communities and for people like Martin Luther King to be able to rise to the top. You know, it was the women and it is the women. Women are strong and there's still a war on women in yeah. this country yeah. and That's 77 right. cents for every man's dollar, yeah. you know, still yeah. time for a change. Yeah. Yeah. There, there's a story that, that you told me on the phone when we were preparing for the program, and I want to make sure we, we cover it. Uh, you, it was like, like half a century ago, you were on the safety committee of a PTA at an elementary school that was downhill from the rich people's house. The rich people's houses were higher up on the hill, and the storm water would rush down. Tell us that story pretty briefly. But yeah. Yes, uh, um, we lived in the apartment, and, you know, logs were coming down and children had to cross to the, you know, get to the elementary school. So I was on the safety committee and a member pointed out, took pictures and pointed out what was happening. Yeah, all the stormwater and, just yeah. a and terrible so, um, safety hazard. Uh, one of the teachers was married to a, a leader of the UA, United Automobile Workers Union who were working in the community. So they joined with us you know, we had the United Automobile, and, and they used their United Automobile Workers Union, CIO, and used their resources, and we were able to hold large community meetings, and uh, <clears throat> some of the, we got a city councilman who, to listen, and so we ended up getting a bridge. Uh -huh. So I, at that time, I said, we're, and this is during the Vietnam War, said so we're building bridges, not going to, you know, uh -huh. wanting to end right. wars. But somehow how things happen accidentally, and we have to be alert and listen. Yeah. And other people take the leadership. Yeah. And uh, we join with them and can work in a so community. It's, it's, again, finding allies. But I thought that was such a good story, and the punchline was so good about building bridges. Uh, but, uh, so we not, don't have necessarily have all the wisdom. Mm -hmm. Um, we have to listen to other Lis folks. Listening, and several people have, have mentioned with, uh, the mm -hmm. listening uh, here and, and the youth and, and so forth. Uh, a closing thought from anybody, and we'll wrap this thing up. Not in any particular sequence. It doesn't have to be everybody, but if anybody has a closing thought, we can squeeze it in. I think we're going to work together more and more positively as... Uh, situations get more and more dire. Um, I truly have felt that there's a good coalition of uh, activism here in this city, and I'm proud of that. And it's an honor to be here tonight with all of you, and also, of course, to be here with you. I think we, we will work together, Bortai, although you're right, the schisms still exist in groups, environmental peace, you know, I mean, we really, it's all the same struggle. Yeah. Bottom line, yeah. you can't drink oil, you can't breathe natural gas, you can't eat polluted dirt, and you can't grow anything in it either. Mm -hmm. And you can't foster any kind of love with a polluted mind. And we've got a lot of that. And yeah. we're a very, um, I'm not a mobile phone person myself, I don't have a cell, but you know, I think people are divorced from each other because of that technology in some ways. So just staying alert and 
being real mm -hmm. and not virtual. <laughs> yeah, face to face is, is crucial. I, I agree with you. I, yeah. In, in, in the, the good organizing, look at all the good organizing that was done face to face yeah. in years past. And now people think, well, I sent an email out, that's sufficient. <laughs> no, it's not. You gotta, flash you, mobs you gotta, happen. Mm -hmm. with, yes. You know, that yeah. can happen yeah. really well. Yeah. Yeah. Cash mobs, flash mobs yeah. that, are, that are benign, yeah. hopefully. Yeah. Yeah, I'm really pleased to have been here tonight and, and met all of you and listened to some of your backgrounds. It's amazing uh, yeah. some of the uh, people that we have in Olympia now. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, that, and that probably would be true in other communities, but in Olympia we, we do a better job of pulling that out, evoking that and having people share. Mm -hmm. Other communities that, that uh, would, would probably benefit by finding out, you know, who are these old characters and what have they been up to all these years? And maybe I don't know my neighbor, but uh, maybe my neighbor's done some really good stuff. And I benefit from learning about it. I think we benefit from TCTV too. Yes. Very much so, yeah. having this facility yeah. and yeah. these volunteers. Well, I want to thank all of you for being here. I want to thank Holly Gwynn Graham and Gabby Clayton and Bortai Hargrove and Ruth Lippo. I want to thank all the folks who've been watching. Our nation and our world really are suffering from huge problems uh, from war and other kinds of violence, social and economic injustice, damage to our environment and our climate. The problems seem so overwhelming and all of our formal systems, governments, big business, centralized media and so forth, seem so totally corrupt and dysfunctional. A lot of people feel overwhelmed and powerless to do anything about it. But what we've seen tonight and heard tonight is people, ordinary folks from our community, and the same would be true in other communities, have actually done a lot of things and we can learn from our past and we can find ways to move forward and actually solve the problems. The peace movement and social justice and environmental movements have accomplished a lot, especially because of the organizing efforts and tireless dedication of hardworking women for many, many years, and we need to recognize that as well. We should be grateful in our community and elsewhere for these efforts. Uh, also, each person who is watching the program here has uh, experiences and insights that you can draw upon and use those to apply either to the same issues you've worked on or to other issues that you care about. So we all have to work together and create a more humane future. You can get information about a wide variety of issues that relate to peace, social justice, and nonviolence from the Olympia Fellowship of Reconciliation, 360-491-9093, www.olympiafor.org. We are all one human planet. We're all one human family. We can create a better world, but we all have to work at it. And the world needs what you have to offer. Thanks.